Hello traders, this is Ilya Spivak, currency strategist with Daily FX, and we'll be talking about the aftermath of the Brexit referendum, where the volatility leaves us, and how we are going to move forward from here. Talk about the outlook for the week ahead as well. Before we get started, uh, if you guys would please type into the chat box, let me know if you can hear me, let me know if the video is coming through okay for you, and we will begin. Apologies for the late start, we had some technical difficulties here, but we should be good to go now. So just let me know if all is well, okay, seems like we're all set. So let's obviously unpack a little bit what happened last week. The UK voted, the referendum has passed, and the unlikely outcome that the UK would opt to leave the European Union has transpired. Obviously, as you can see, the markets were not ready and did not expect this result. Otherwise, we would not be getting this kind of aggressive volatility. As you can see, the S&P moved aggressively lower. Gold soared. The U.S. dollar soared. Crude oil fell with stocks. Euro obviously aggressively down, sterling aggressively down, dollar yen aggressively down amid risk aversion and broad based yen strength. In fact, if we unpack this entire thing in a multi asset kind of way, then we can clearly see here this is an average of the pounds value these candles as you can see against its major counterparts it fell the yen this is an average of the yen against its major counterparts as you can see right here this rose stocks fell if you take a look at bond yields right bonds jumped with yen so y yields collapsed higher yielding currencies fell with stocks, with uh, the pound, and you can really see this essentially across the board. In fact, if you wanted to, for example, see how this compares with what crude oil did, here's crude oil and you can see we'll adjust it to be a line so you guys can see it a bit more c clearly here's crude oil and you can see th the same thing the same move basically all around risk off haven assets so now the question becomes, well, what's going to move markets this week? And for that, we need to come back and think about what it is that is the point of concern with all of this uh, Brexit news flow. And remind ourselves that the reason that the markets were unnerved by this in the first place is because of uncertainty. Not because the markets had really an opinion on whether Brexit is good or Brexit is bad, necessarily. More so that Brexit would be uncertain 
and status quo would not be uncertain status quo would be baseline and investors know what to do with the baseline so now we have uncertainty and we have lingering uncertainty because now a whole range of things has to happen the UK Prime Minister said he would step down in three months time we have to figure out who the next one is going to be odds are it seems to be uh, Boris Johnson the former mayor of London and uh, until this latest referendum the second most popular politician in the UK after David Cameron himself although obviously David Cameron is probably not quite so popular anymore so now we have to see is Boris Johnson going to be the next to be Prime Minister if he is how is he going to move this Brexit process forward? We got a little bit of a clue on that. He put out an article um, over the weekend painting his vision, saying a lot of very conciliatory things, saying uh, that he thinks there is no rush to extricate the UK from the European Union, that he envisions continued access to the single market, that he envisions uh, a deep relationship with the Europeans, with the continental Europeans. Now, this presents some interesting questions. If the UK were to embark on an association agreement similar to what Norway has similar to what Switzerland has then it would have to pay into the Brussels budget and it would likely have to accept the free movement of people which were key points for the Leave campaign and a key reason why the Leave campaign uh, sort of gave for what they for why they wanted to do this why they wanted to exit. So, this represents some contradictions, but if indeed this is the deal that's done, that would be the least amount of damage. The damage would be relatively near term, but still, still, we have three months of uncertainty. In that best case scenario. While that continues, we have a likely hit to UK economic growth because businesses are not going to want to expand and hire more people and invest in more uh, capacity at a time that is uncertain. They're going to want to see what, what all this looks like because close to 50% of UK exports are heading for the continent. So if there are going to be greater barriers then a business is going to want to know that before committing to expansion. Before committing to hiring people. So that's going to hurt consumption. It's going to hurt economic growth. At least for these next three months. Best case scenario that's going to have knock-on effects because the UK is also a major end market not only for the uh, euro area and not only for the larger EU but for many other places as well if you dent consumption that spreads to those countries that depend on that consumption that hurts economic growth beyond the UK's 
borders and indeed beyond the EU's borders. It also fuels risk aversion, all this uncertainty, which as we see from the chart in front of you, has bolstered support, for example, for the yen. We can also see here that if we were to add the US dollar, the index to this chart, and we'll put that as a line as well so that it is easier to see. There we go, that white line is going to be the US dollar. You can see that rose as well as a safe haven. Now, if you have three months of uncertainty, you're going to have probably a stronger dollar, probably a stronger yen. That's going to hurt inflation. It's going to make inf it's going to pressure inflation lower, so it probably undermines the case f for a Fed rate hike in any kind of foreseeable near term. It also might open the door for some sort of Bank of Japan intervention into foreign exchange markets. Not necessarily a big splash intervention but some kind of intervention, either via expanded monetary stimulus or via just outright management of the exchange rate. And it may be a big splash intervention, but it may also be a sort of intervention by stealth, where the exchange rate is just managed quietly behind the scenes with the BOJ entering the market to counter volatility, but in smaller sizes in a, and in a more methodical uh way rather than just one big huge move so those are all possibilities now as, as far as this week goes we still have a lot on this Brexit story that is going to continue to occupy our attention because if the name of the game is uncertainty and if much of the rest of everything else is contingent on how this is going to play out then we are going to have to continue to watch first and foremost the Brexit narrative and from there extrapolate what everything else is likely going to look like. So for example, over the next 24 hours, although there is some economic data that, that is of note that will be coming across the wires, U.S. Uh, market uh, PMIs, services, and uh, composite, those are due to cross the wires. They might have been significant for Fed policy bets, but of course Fed policy bets have been crushed in the aftermath of this. Here is um, the one-year Fed policy outlook implied in Fed funds futures, and you can see they've plunged. So this is the current rate for the Fed funds range from 25 to 50 basis points. This is where we are, and you can see that we've crashed here to suggest that by year end we're going to be in the same spot. So no rate hikes for 2016 as far as the markets think at this point. And given this outcome and given the probable implications for the US dollar, that seems to make sense. At least thus far. What we're going to focus on instead over the next 24 hours at least is going to be a referendum or a, a forum rather uh, that the ECB is holding in Sintra Portugal 
The governors of the big four central banks are going to be there. President Mario Draghi of the ECB, for the Fed's Janet Yellen, the BOE's Mark Carney, and the People Bank of China Governor uh, Zhao Shishuan is going to be there. And it'll be interesting to see what they have to say about this Brexit stuff. Now, they're probably not going to offer policy specifics. It's probably going to be platitudes mostly. But nonetheless, it is worth listening to. Then on Tuesday, the EU Parliament will vote on a resolution for how to respond to what the UK just did. The contents of that vote will be very interesting because it will perhaps help to shape what is going to be the deal that the uh, the UK is going to get when they go to negotiate their terms of leaving after the new Prime Minister comes in in three months' time. We're also going to get uh, the uh, revised set of uh, first quarter U.S. GDP figures. Those are expected to uh, see a further upgrade to growth. This will be the second revision. The first revision upgraded growth from five-tenths to eight-tenths of a percent annualized. This one is expected to upgrade it from eight-tenths to a full one percent. But it is doubtful that this is really going to matter all that much. Because again, it will have little to no implications for near-term monetary policy. Also, on Tuesday, U.S. consumer confidence. Comments from SNB Vice President Zürbrug, as well as comments from uh, Fed Governor Powell. But again, unless we are going to get immediate policy specifics, which in the Fed's case is unlikely, then we're probably not going to get anything. Uh, comments from uh, the SMB vice president uh, might be interesting in that um, we might hear how they plan to deal with the aftermath. They are, after all, in Europe. The franc is, to some extent, a regional alternative. But, of course, they are implementing negative rates already to try and discourage capital. And so there will be a very serious question to be asked of the Swiss uh, in the sense that uh, are they going to push, perhaps, rates deeper into negative territory? Are they going to enact some sort of other measures to discourage investment in the uh, franc to discourage capital flows from abandoning the euro for Switzerland or from abandoning the pound for Switzerland and what that's going to look like. Moving ahead on Wednesday we are once again in post Brexit mode. And really, that's going to be the theme here. On Wednesday, we get German CPI, though, again, in as much as uh, this doesn't really mean anything for near-term uh, ECB monetary policy, it doesn't so much matter. We're also going to get the Fed's favored uh, U.S. PCE inflation gauge, though... If rate hikes are not anywhere on the horizon in the near term, then there is not a reason to really uh, approach that with any immediate expectation of volatility. Yellen is speak is speaking uh, in Portugal at that ECB summit. 
We'll see what she has to say about the implications of this on rates if she decides to be that detailed. On Thursday, we're going to get Eurozone CPI numbers. Those are expected to uh, come in unchanged at the core year-on-year -year rate. The um, actual headline number is, is expected to print flat, which would be a mild improvement over deflation in the prior month. But in reality, we are, of course, not going to get the ECB pursuing any kind of tightening in the near term. All the more so after this Brexit outcome. So those numbers mean relatively little. And then we're also going to get the Jap uh, the Japanese Tonkin Large Manufacturer Survey where we're looking for a little bit of a slowdown in activity. We'll see if that emboldens BOJ action. If the number is uh, weaker than expected, in particular, then we might surmise that the BOJ might be a little bit more open to doing some sort of intervention regime. It should be noted that since uh, about mid-May, Japanese economic data has tended to deteriorate relative to consensus forecasts, and so there is the possibility that um, we have a downside surprise here telegraphed therein. Now, on Friday, whereas we would have normally had um, NFP, because it is the first Friday of the month, that's not going to be the case this time around, because uh, the July 4th holiday is coming up in the U.S., and so uh, we are going to save NFP actually for the week after. So that's not going to be on the agenda this time. Instead, uh, we're going to finish the week relatively quiet with ISM manufacturing numbers out of the U.S. Uh, we are also uh, going to get here a... Um, ISM roundup from China and Japan. But again, in as much as this doesn't really give us anything material in the near term, we are probably going to continue to focus on what risk sentiment is going to do surrounding negotiations, surrounding what we continue to hear, uh, and also surrounding efforts which are not uh, irrelevant here to actually annul this referendum. There was a petition that was put forward ahead of the referendum, actually, by one of the leavers who has had it somewhat run away on him. His idea was that any referendum with a turnout of less than 75% in which the winning side has garnered less than 60% is not actually representative of the will of the electorate. It's not enough people. And if that's the case, then the referendum should be called moot. It should be called invalid. Well, it just so happens that we had 72% of the electorate, so it doesn't meet that threshold. And Levers won with a 52% margin, so well shy of 60%. Now, in the UK, there is a rule that, it, that any 
petition that has over a hundred thousand signatures must get a hearing in Parliament. The interesting thing is this petition has already gotten three million signatures. Now, this this petition will be considered for debate. If it is actually debated in Parliament, the current Parliament doesn't have enough levers to back it. That is to back actually activating Article 50 and actually going through with Brexit. The majority of Parliament is on the Remain side of EU membership. So, what we have now is the interesting possibility, which only adds to the uncertainty, that we are going to have a situation where maybe this whole ordeal just gets annulled altogether. Which, of course, then raises the question... Will the Brexiteers demand another referendum? Will they get it? Will the outcome be different? And so forth. All of this seems like it's only going to prolong uncertainty and prolong the negative impact that it has on economic growth and prolong all of these dynamics that we've been talking about. So this is really likely to color markets for quite a while. The real danger is, of course, that it also emboldens Eurosceptic forces outside of the UK, making the Euro decidedly vulnerable because we've already heard from Parties in other countries, Netherlands, Spain, France, that would like to hold their own referendums. That's, of course, at the heart of the Eurozone. Now, we had an election in Spain over the weekend, and it worked out, actually, that the Brexit result, the market violence after it, appeared to strengthen support for the status quo. So the uh, incumbent PP party actually secured more votes in this election than it did in their first crack at a general election back in December. Came a little bit closer toward building a coalition at the center-right with the Ciudadanos party. So that's actually mildly good news in the sense that uh, from a risk aversion perspective it slows the tide. If what emerges is a case where the Brexit thing looks like a cautionary tale not just for Spain but elsewhere. But we shall have to see. We don't know at this point yet if this will embolden or discourage like-minded, referenda-minded parties attempting to tear the EU asunder. That we'll have to wait and see. Andy's asking, would you consider a euro pound short or, say, a kiwi dollar short? Absolutely. In fact, euro pound is one of the trades that I'm most interested in explicitly because I think the euro is vulnerable, deeply, deeply, deeply vulnerable uh, at this point because of the potential instability that has been created by this uh, and by the possibility that, indeed, there will be copycats that will try to do the same thing in other countries, primarily within the Eurozone. So I think this surge in the Euro against the pound 
makes actually uh, the pound very cheap relative to the, the euro. And so I would be interested in getting short, but not here, clearly, because there is no distinguishable entry signal here at, at this point. We'll need to see how this gap fills in. If this candle comes back down and closes back under the previous high at 81.17, if it closes down here, that would be a very interesting outcome. And that would sort of start the process of setting up a short entry. But at this point, we don't have that kind of setup, so I wouldn't pull the trigger on anything yet. For the Kiwi, here is the Kiwi dollar. You can see it has broken down. It is within a range here uh, of 71.50 to 70.60. That's about a 90 pip range. That works out for a trade, but obviously we are here sitting right at support. So the risk reward here to getting short is clearly adverse. We would need a bounce back to at least 71.20 to make this work. So in the near time it doesn't s seem to make sense to pull the trigger. So for right now, I would uh, I would stand aside on both counts. All right, that unfortunately wraps us up here. I don't see any more questions, so it looks like uh, you guys are ready as well. I'll take one more question here. Michael was asking, uh, would you not uh, uh, would you consider euro pound short? Or uh, would you not sell euro dollar as opposed to euro pound? I would sell both. But when you look at euro and pound, what you have is the same risk in both, only one has rallied. When you look at euro dollar, you don't have the risk in both. So you essentially don't have a discount opportunity. In this case, the safer c currency has already strengthened. And I absolutely expect it to strengthen further. But in Euro-Pound, you have a greater opportunity because the currency that is vulnerable, namely the Euro, has strengthened which means this is cheaper this euro is more expensive relatively speaking and so it is a more attractive short but again we have to wait we have to l see the setups in both cases because here we don't have confirmation of reversal here in euro dollar we are as with the kiwi too close to support to make for acceptable risk reward. So either way, there's not an actionable setup. And I would like to be short the euro in, in both cases, but euro pound I think presents more relative value. Okay, let's call it a day here. As always, you can follow up with me at Ilya Spivak via Twitter if you have any follow-up questions. If you would like to sign up for my email distribution list to receive my analysis directly, here is a link where you can do that. Be very careful out there, everybody. It's still a very touchy environment. Good luck out there this week. Take care.